Hello and welcome to the Jump Music Initiative podcast. Um, today, our guest is Allison Lynch. We're so happy to have you here. Um, Allison is a composer, singer songwriter, multi instrumentalist, and also an actor. Um, and you're kind of like our first person who's been in the theater world to be on the show. Um, oh. She grew up in a musical family with um, both her parents are jazz musicians. She started playing piano and violin at the age of six and then also plays guitar and um, ukulele, quite a bit of ukulele I've seen you play. Um, <laughs> Allison, in addition to being an actor, is also a sound designer, a composer and a musical, the um, and a musical director, which is all very cool. Uh, she is currently working on her second album, um, which is incredible. We're so glad to have you here, Allison. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> so I gave kind of like a tiny bit of highlights about you, um, but do you want to tell us just a little bit more about how you got started in music and what your role in the music industry is? Sure, yeah. I mean, I got started, uh, as you mentioned, I have a very musical family. So my parents, uh, you know, they they were always playing music around the house when I was a kid. My dad being a piano player and my mom being a singer. Uh, and my brother um, was always interested in music as well. And he's turned out to be a drummer. So um, yeah, lots of music in the house at a young age. Um, I remember always falling asleep to the sound of my dad at the piano. And when I went for my first sleepover when I was like seven years old or something, I remember thinking, why isn't her dad playing the piano? Like we're going to bed, shouldn't, shouldn't he be playing? I just thought that was like normal in everyone's household. So, um, yeah, lots of music in the family and then uh, didn't really get involved into music professionally until uh, I guess um, in my second or so year of university, I started to get interested in that um, and be pushed a little bit more in that direction. So I, I guess, my role, I have a few roles in the music industry currently. Um, the first one being as a, a composer and sound designer for, for theater. Um, I also write sometimes for short films or um, podcasts, that kind of thing. Um, and then as uh, also as a performer um, of my own music and also uh, with like jazz duos, trios, quartets, that kind of thing. And then as also sometimes as a music director as well, usually within the theater as well. Very neat. Um, okay, so I think um, a lot of people that aren't involved in the theater industry have no idea what a sound designer is. So can you kind of um, break down that, that role in theater and how it applies um, to your musical background and um, kind of how maybe how you got into it? In the first place? Sure. Yeah, so a, uh, a sound designer um, basically uh, is responsible for everything that you would hear uh, during the play when you're at a theater experience. So any music that you hear uh, prior to the show beginning, any music that you hear throughout the show, like maybe transition scenes or underscoring of scenes, um, any music that you would hear at the intermission and after the show as well. And even sometimes the music that you'd hear in the lobby would be um, curated by the sound designer. Um, and in addition to that, also all of the sound effects in the show uh, would be taken care of by the sound designer. So the phone ringing or the radio in the background or whatever. And um, also, so you can be a sound designer in the theater uh, world without being a composer per se. Um, some theaters do allow for the music that's used within the production to be music that's already created by other musicians. Um, but that does get tricky in terms of uh, royalties and that sort of thing, the rights to music. So most often it is original music composed by uh, the sound designer composer. So in that case, it might be live music. Sometimes the actors play instruments and I'll write music for them to play or to sing in many cases as well. Um, and then I guess uh, in getting started with that, um, I went to St. Mary's University College in my first year out of high school. And it was there that I uh, got in touch with Marilyn Potts 
who is, um, she's a teacher and she's very involved in the, the educational side of the theater as well as the professional side uh, and has taught a lot of Calgary's professional actors over her years um, being a teacher. And so she kind of uh, asked me just if I would uh, sound design a show that she was directing. And I had no idea what that meant. And so she had to explain it to me. And uh, really it was just kind of trial and error of sort of figuring out, well, how much time do you need between this scene and this scene? And how long will it take the actors to change their costumes in this moment? So how much music do I have to create? And it was really kind of just figuring it out. Uh, there wasn't really like, I didn't take any classes or anything. I just kind of got thrown into it. And I've often found that that's kind of the best way to learn a lot of mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I read that you actually created the score for um, A Christmas Carol by uh, Theatre Calgary. So can you tell us a little bit more about maybe that process specifically, but what goes into writing a score? Yeah, um, well, so this year, um, well, the, this past year, 2020 Christmas Carol, uh, obviously we were not able to gather in the way that we normally would. So I've been a part of A Christmas Carol at Theatre Calgary for the past 10 years. And the first eight years were part of um, the previous production. Uh, and in 2019, Theatre Calgary decided to um, kind of revamp the show and do a, a new production. That's sort of what they've done over the years. They'll do a a new script, new um, costumes, new designs, new actors, often, not always, a lot of the actors were recycled, including myself, which I'm very grateful for. <laughs> but um, so for this new year, 2019, uh, I was brought on as a performer in the show, yes, but also as the composer, sound designer, and musical director. So in that case, we were all there on stage together. This is in the before times. Um, so there were many actors on stage and all of the actors also sang uh, pieces that I created for them to sing. So a lot of those things were like uh, original Christmas carols that I composed for them. Um, and then also some Christmas carols that you would know or that you would have heard of previously. Um, so part of my job there was um, being on stage as the fiddler. So I played the fiddle and was kind of the narrator of the show. And then also I was um, helping the cast to learn their parts, their singing parts, and to uh, deliver those parts on stage. And then the other side of that was the sound design side. Uh, and that involved um, the sound effects, as I was talking about, and also all of the um, incidental music between scenes and underneath scenes. So in order to do that, I would use my uh, composing software. Um, so I use a program called Logic Pro X and uh, a, um, a bunch of different software libraries. Um, so, you know, various strings and um, wind instruments, um, brass, and all everything I can think of um, went into Christmas Carol because it's such a grand scale kind of show. So that was sort of the orchestral sound was kind of appropriate for that show. So I composed that music at home uh, with my software instruments. And then we added in the live elements, um, including my fiddle. And then the uh, we also had two guitars uh, live on stage as well. Um, and then differing from that was this year's production, which obviously we could not gather in the same way with a huge cast. So this year's production was online. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what we did was I composed the, the music. Um, it was kind of a much more pared down sort of uh, orchestration because the the actual show was pared down. There were only three actors, a very minimal set. So I tried to match the vibe of the of the score to that aesthetic mm -hmm. by having uh, mostly just strings. And um, I did. I was playing uh, my own violin as well. It was a little more complicated in that scenario because it was filmed. So it's hard to have live music while you're filming and then be able to splice those scenes together without the music kind of being off 
-hmm. So what I did was recorded the music uh, ahead of time. And then for the filming, in order to show that I was playing the violin, I had um, an in-ear monitor with the actual score that I'd written playing just for me so that I could basically play along to my own score so that it would time out with the filming, but not interfere with the the actors and with the whatever else was going on on stage and so that it could be lined up in the post-production of the film. That was a really long explanation, but yeah. <laughs> no, that was awesome. And wow, so composing original music for a story that's already there, that is a much different process than just maybe writing what comes to you as an artist. So what are some of the things you do to get in the zone or maybe to, um, get in the heads of the characters or the performance to actually be able to write something that supports the story? Well, in order to do that, uh, in terms of a theater production, it, it's a very collaborative process. So um, really everyone is working together in order to uh, further the, the narrative of the story or to tell a compelling story. It's all about compelling storytelling. So every every designer and the actor and the um, director, we're all working together in order to uh, lift the, the words off the page. So I think in order to uh, create something that really uh, fits that a certain play, uh, it's important, I think, to really be familiar with the script. Um, so I usually read it a few times before we start any kind of rehearsing or anything like that. I'm usually not present for all of rehearsals, but I will, as often as I can, go in to watch the rehearsing of the show. Uh, it's really helpful for me because a lot of times the actors and their personalities and the way that they interpret the characters is quite different from what I might have interpreted myself. And um, seeing their interpretation and combining it with my own really, I find, um, really makes for some interesting and inspiring material. So that's really what gives me uh, what I need in order to get started and in order to start thinking about what kind of instrumentation might be appropriate or if there's going to be live music or if it'll be recorded or what, you know, if it's going to be kind of classical or if it'll be electronic or that kind of thing. So I think it's in order to get inspired, I need to hear the words spoken by the, by the people who are playing those characters. For sure. Man, that, that is really cool. I, I didn't even really think about, I mean, I think I always assumed that music was all composed before they even started rehearsals, but listening to you talk about that makes so much sense. Thanks, Allison. Um, yeah. So I forgot to mention in your bio that you have a bachelor's of on, honors in, um, classical vocal performance and also composition. Is that right? Yeah, yeah okay. So um, tell us a little, little bit about why you chose to go to school and if you feel like it's um, it's been helpful, like making that decision to get your degree was helpful in kind of your world as a professional. Yeah, I think um, when, I, well, when I first uh, went into university, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I even though my family had been very musical, I never really pictured myself being a professional musician. So uh, I just kind of took random classes and didn't really have a plan for a specific degree that I wanted to get. Um, but in taking the, so basically what happened this is kind of embarrassing, but I wanted to, to find a class that would be really easy, like, like minimum effort to fill out my schedule so that I would be considered a full-time student. Cause I, you know, I didn't have a regular set out. Well, here's the courses you need to do in order to get this specific degree. Cause I had no idea what degree I was doing. So I asked around like, what's an easy zero effort course. <laughs> and a lot of people said drama, take drama. That's easy. So I took drama and it was terrifying and hard and like, it was so scary and I'd never had to do anything that they were asking me to do. And through that, the drama class was how I actually got more interested in pursuing music um, for my education because of that teacher, uh, Marilyn Potts and her asking me to do the sound design for her, for her show. Then I thought, this is actually something I really 
find fascinating. And if I hadn't been open to trying this random thing, I never would have uh, felt this pull towards this or seen this door open to this other sort of thing that I could do. So at that point I decided, I think I really do want to pursue music seriously. And because I loved singing and because I had taken some classical lessons, singing at that point, I thought I want to be able to do both of these things better and at a professional level. And I want to be able to open up some more possibilities for myself uh, professionally and, and in the future. So doing that degree was, um, it was very, very uh, beneficial for me, just in terms of making me a better performer um, and kind of showing me what was possible as I, I really had no idea ever until, until university that what I'm doing now was even a possibility. Oh my gosh. I love that. I love that. I think there's so much pressure on people to know everything and have their whole professional idea of life planned out, especially if you want to be a musician. And I have some similarities with you in, your, in, in sort of the beginning of your university degrees. Um, vibes. I didn't know what I was doing either. And also, <laughs> it. and I just think that's so inspiring. They, and also that you hadn't even taken a, a class in acting before that. Um, and then you, and now you're a professional actor. <laughs> Allison. Yeah. I mean, it's possible. It's like, just, you know, if you just try all the things, just throw the stuff, the paint at the <laughs> canvas and something's going to come of it. <laughs> For sure. That. I wanted to ask you, um, so you're a musician and an actress. So how does being a musician help you uh, in your acting career and especially maybe a vocalist? What are the benefits of being able to do both? Well, I think um, having multiple sort of uh, tricks in your basket, is that how you'd say it? Um, <laughs> uh, having, being able to do more than one thing is definitely uh, going to help you uh, especially if you want to be an actor, it's really great if you can play an instrument or if you can sing because a lot of productions nowadays uh, are exploring that kind of thing where they'll be asking actors to do multiple things. They might want you to dance. They might want you to do, um, you know, some kind of interpretive movement. They might want you to be able to improvise or play music or sing music. There's they might ask you for all of those things. And the more that you are comfortable at least exploring, uh, the more hireable really you are because um, yeah, that's just become more common that people are asking actors to also do other things. And I think um, if you do work on your skills as a, as a singer or a musician, you're more likely to be considered for musicals as well and dancing, although I would not consider myself a dancer, but yeah, the more tricks you've got, uh, the more hireable you are and, and the more interesting I think you can make yourself as a, as a performer. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, also, so you spoke a little bit about um, how you got into acting. Would you say that, so this is a bit of a weird question, but music obviously, delves into the role uh, to the world of acting but does it go the other way around do these two career paths really interact and work together has being an actress really helped yeah. you in your music career yeah i think um i think it i think it really has because you know when you're performing a song that you've written or that someone else has written you're effectively you are telling a story there as well right you're you're delivering a message or telling a story to your audience and um acting or interpreting the text is is acting you know so if you're just singing your own song you are still telling uh, you're delivering a narrative to your audience and you want to you want them to be compelled and to be interested in what you're delivering right so i do think that my training that I have had experience as an actor has helped me quite a bit um, on stage and also just being comfortable between songs, you know, at a gig. I don't feel like I have to just stand there and, oh God, please start the music so I don't have to talk to these people. <laughs> it's, it's helped me a lot in that way. And in, in, a, in another way, um, I do find that a lot of text, uh, like uh, playwriting or uh, play texts are 
um, they're very musical, especially for example, Shakespeare. Uh, you know, Shakespeare's writing is is extremely lyric and um, and musical, and I do find that it's I think maybe easier to interpret the the language if you have some connection or some comfortability with uh, with music or with um, you know with singing or with playing an instrument. Uh, I think those two can really really complement each other. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit, little bit about you as a singer songwriter as an, and as a solo artist. Um, one, I'm very curious about how um, com how you, composing and writing for yourself really differs from for, from writing from shows, or if it does, or if they're all really kind of linked. Can you just talk us talk to us a little bit about writing for your own music? Yeah, uh, well, a lot of times. Um... I have to say, like, I, I think I'm definitely lazier about writing my own music because <laughs> if I'm writing for a show, I'm, I'm on a contract and I have a I have some deadlines and that kind of thing. So those kind of keep me like, all right, like, let's get this done. Uh, whereas writing for myself, I often comes up, I find it, it comes up out of, oh, I'm, I feel inspired by such and such a thing. So I'm going to start writing something or working on a, a new song. Um, so it's trickier to be, um, I guess, a little more regimented in uh, uh, or strict with myself in terms of getting that kind of work done. Um, but in terms of the actual content that I'm creating, I'd say in writing for myself, it, it is quite personal to me. And um, I will try, you know, I will write sometimes from another person's perspective, maybe like entering to a sort of a character kind of state to write something. But um, I find the best songs that I have written or the ones that connect best with other people tend to be the ones that are very personal to me or that um, are about a personal experience or something like that. That's mm -hmm. the kind of write what you know thing that people say sometimes. <laughs> so I guess it's true. Right, absolutely. Do you have a preference over um, between the two worlds, what you like to do more or spend more time doing? Honestly, I, I love both because it's for such different reasons. I love writing for the theater because it, it turns out to be such a collaborative kind of experience. And uh, working with so many different people on a show, uh, you know, everybody's different backgrounds and different identities um, coming together and merging is what makes the art so exciting. Whereas, you know, when I'm at home or I'm just writing my own music, it's, it's exciting in, in the way that I'm getting to express something maybe that I have been thinking about a lot, or I get to kind of create a message that I want people to hear. So I kind of get to scratch both those itches in a way I get to uh, feed that personal desire to express and then in the theater also um, feed off of other people's energy and sort of elevate my own creative work with their ideas as well. Thank you, Allison. That's so much awesome advice for young musicians, especially maybe those not knowing what they want to do yet or considering both paths. So that's awesome. Thank you yeah. so much for being here with us. The last thing I wanted to ask you, we ask all of our guests at the end would be, what, what is one piece of advice you would have, you would give to young musicians just starting? Or maybe you could think of it like, what would you say to your past self? Uh, I would, I would say, don't limit yourself by thinking that you already have all the answers. If you can be mm -hmm. open and have a collaborative spirit and um, a willingness to uh, to admit that maybe you don't know everything that you're capable of, uh, I think um, the doors remain open for you, all of them, until you decide that they're closed. So remain open. That's awesome. Yes, Thank you so that. much, Allison. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thanks for having me. With you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Have a great Yay. rest of your day. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Awesome. Yay. All right.
Um, Are you gone? No, don't, you don't have to go. We, we just like <laughs> cut it off there. But yeah, oh. thanks so much for coming, Allison, and for being a part oh, of welcome. this. Yeah, for it's sure. just so special to hear, like to hear kind of your story. And I think there's just, um, there's so many other worlds that we just don't even know about as musicians, you know, especially when we're just learning our instruments and focused as kids, like practicing and we don't even know all of the options. So I just, I love the advice that you gave and um, just been sharing sort of your journey. Yeah. I feel like it's such a hopeful message to, to lost people, which is so many, <laughs> yeah, oh even gosh. as we get older. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Get into the theater design business. It's like, what are you doing right now? Um, just waiting for coronavirus to go away. <laughs> but eventually, yeah, it will. Things yes. will open up again. And yeah, totally. Totally. <laughs> Well, have an amazing day. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Nice to meet you. You too. See ya.